Let me tell you about Codex Alimentarius. Let me define it for you. Let me tell you, let me help you understand the enemy. And let me assure you that absolutely nothing that I'm going to tell you is exaggerated, is interpolated, or is imagined. Everything I'm going to tell you is documented. And it's, a great deal of it is documented on my website, which is www.healthfreedomusa, one word, healthfreedomusa.org. Let me back up and tell you that I've been watching Codex come toward us for about the last decade. And I've been watching the votes in Congress, which God help us, is our bastion of support and protection against Codex, and I'll explain why that is. I've been watching the votes to protect our health freedom dwindle until finally in the 109th Congress, without a good deal of activity, we didn't have the votes to protect us. I've been watching Codex accelerate, and I've been watching it expand, and I've been getting more and more troubled. Let me give you a brief rundown of Codex then. After the Second World War, the Nuremberg Tribunals were held, in which people who had committed crimes against humanity were judged by the world community in a court run by the United States and Britain, and they were sentenced to terms in prison if they were found guilty of crimes against humanity. One of the people found guilty of crimes against humanity was the president of a, a huge industrial megalith called IG Farben. IG Farben produced the gas used in the gas chambers, Cyclone B. They produced the steel for the death camps and the railroad lines. They produced the munitions. They produced chemicals. They produced all kinds of stuff. They produced pharmaceuticals. Big, 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 big pharmaceutical company. So the president of IG Farben was convicted of crimes against humanity. Now, he's a sort of artistic fellow and creative. He was the one who was responsible for the slogan that people saw as they entered Auschwitz, usually for the last time. Arbeit macht frei. Work brings freedom. Creative sort of fellow. So he was sitting in jail and he said, well, that didn't work. <laughs> what else can we do? I've got it. Food. He who controls food controls the world. So when he got out of jail, he went to his UN buddies and he said, have I got an idea for you. If we take over food worldwide, we have power worldwide. And his UN buddies said, cool idea. And so they created a trade commission. That's a very important pair of words, a trade commission called the Codex Alimentarius Commission. It is not a public health commission. It is not a consumer protection commission. It is a trade commission. Trade is about what? Money. Money. Yeah. Business. Trade is about profit. Well, they said in 1962, we're going to work toward total global implementation of Codex Alimentarius on December 31st, 2009. Long term. And they set up a bunch of committees, committees on fish and fishery, fats and oil, fruits and vegetables, ground nuts, uh, nutrition and foods for special dietary uses, and so on. There are currently about 27 Codex Committee. There are regional organizations. There are task forces and so on. So it's a huge bureaucratic monstrosity. It's immense. Codex has promulgated well over 4,000 guidelines, standards, and regulations on everything, everything which can legally be put into your mouth with the exception of pharmaceuticals. They are not part of Codex. Important. Now, Codex standards 
have no legal weight whatsoever. Zero. So who cares about them? They're just standards. So we're talking about an industry-dominated regulation setting organization, but if it has no legal standing, who cares, right? Here's the history of Codex Alimentarius before 1962. The Austro-Hungarian Empire said, we need rules by which the courts can rule on cases involving food. So we'll have regulations and rules that the courts will enforce. That's how they get their weight. That was called the Codex Alimentarius, and it was put into place around 1893 and lasted until the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the First World War. So the idea was there in the Germanic tradition. We need rules, lots of rules, lots and lots of rules. We need a lot of rules. Let's have rules for everything to do with food. So it was sort of a natural extension for the German industrialists to say, we'll go back to the good old days of Codex Alimentarius, back when we had them in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Cool. So they started promulgating their rules and regulations, and they were voluntary. They were sort of guidelines. Now, Codex Alimentarius Commission is administered by the World Health Organization, WHO, and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. They fund Codex, and they run it at the request of the UN. So they're mommy and daddy to Codex Alimentarius. And that's very interesting, because they're supposed to be about health and food worldwide. Some conflicts of interest that we'll talk about. So Codex started promulgating regulations and rules. And the way that's done is that the committees work up a rule, a standard, a guideline, a regulation, and then they get it to what's called step eight, which is the final step in their administrative process. And then it's presented to the Codex Alimentarius Commission for ratification, like the vitamin and mineral guideline was presented to the Codex Alimentarius Commission on July 4th this past summer. It was ratified, it was approved by consensus, and it is now, despite the propaganda that you're going to hear, if you ever hear about it in the media, it is now mandatory upon any member country of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Well, what in the world do they have to do with it? And the answer is everything. The World Trade Organization, you see, accepted Codex when, it was, when the World Trade Organization was formed in 1994. Okay? They said, well, how are we going to dis decide trade disputes around food if we don't have a set of rules? I know we'll accept the Codex Alimentarius rules, and all the members of the WTO worldwide will get ready for an Orwellian term harmonize with our standards, with the Codex standards. Harmonize. I suggest you capitalize the first four letters in your mind. So everybody's supposed to harmonize with Codex. And when they harmonize with Codex, then if they get pulled into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process, they have a chance of winning. Because, here's the kicker. You ready for this one? If two countries go into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process and one of them is Codex compliant and one of them is not Codex compliant, the one that is Codex compliant automatically wins regardless of the merit of the case. People are using Codex compliance as a weapon in a much bigger economic battle. So, every country in the world is racing to do what? To become Codex compliant. So, in the United States, the situation is, okay, how do we become Codex compliant when we have laws that protect us? And you have to remember that Codex does not serve consumer well-being, does not serve health. It serves what I call the five bigs. Big Pharma, Big Chema, Big Biotechna, Big Agribiz, and Big Medica. Little you and little me are not served by Codex in the least. 
So before we go forward and talk about the rest of what has to happen, let's ask what Codex does. You probably all know about the vitamin and mineral guideline that was ratified on July 4th. You may not know that although it is said that Codex guidelines, regulations, and standards which have been ratified are voluntary, they are not voluntary. That is known as a lie. They are mandatory, but they are not fully mandatory until December 31st, 2009. They're sort of kind of a little bit mandatory now, and they're totally mandatory then. Okay, so what does Codex do? Why do I care enough about Codex to close my practice and stop treating patients who came to me from around the world to help them regain their health and be radiantly well with non-toxic means, which is a very satisfying thing to do. I love it. And it also provided me with an income. I, that was nice. Um, why am I concerned enough? Okay, let's talk about the vitamin and mineral guideline first. In 1994, here in the United States, DSHEA, the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act, was passed, which classifies nutrients and herbs as foods. As foods, you can set no upper limit on them. You cannot set an upper limit on lettuce, lamb, or rutabagas. And similarly, you cannot set an upper limit on vitamin C, echinacea, ginkgo biloba, vitamin D. And Access to nutrients is freely given to us. We are allowed to have any nutrients we want because, and this is a very important point, under common law, anything not forbidden is permitted. Codex, on the other hand, is a Napoleonic Code law system. Under Napoleonic Code, anything not permitted is forbidden. That's called a positive list. So, vitamins and nutrient, minerals. In 1994, we passed Deshay. Nutrients are foods. We can have as much of them as we want. It's our business. In 1994, Codex, with no notice here in this country whatsoever, declared nutrients, put on your intellectual seatbelts, declared nutrients to be toxins. They're poisons dangerous industrial poisons. As poisons, we have to be protected from them. How do you protect somebody from a poison? You use toxicology. You use a science called risk assessment. A quick primer on risk assessment. First, you take the substance that's poisonous and you feed it to animals and you determine the dose that kills 50% of them. That's called the LD50, okay? and you extrapolate what the LD50 for a human being might be. Then, you go down to the other end of the dosage range and you start feeding itty bitty tiny bits of it to test animals. And you come up with the largest possible dose, the maximum permissible upper limit, that can be fed to an animal before a discernible impact is shown. Okay? No discernible impact. Then you divide that by 100. That's how they do it in risk assessment. And now you've got a safety margin. So you've got one one hundredth of the dose that can be given, the largest dose that can be given with no discernible impact. Okay? Nutrients under codex not only are limited to those nutrients on the positive list, and we anticipate there will be 18 of them, and they do not include CoQ10, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate. They do include fluoride, which to my knowledge as a physician has absolutely no biological benefit whatsoever. But it does make people complacent. Fluoride was first used in the gulag because it was discovered that prisoners who were fed fluoridated water were complacent and you could do anything you wanted to them. They were easy to manage. So, you have 18 nutrients, you have itty bitty teeny weeny little bitty doses that are 
determined scientifically to have no effect on any human being now in this country we have a problem we have to say we got to get rid of the shay in order to harm own eyes with codex that part of codex anyway so how do we get rid of the shay we attack it legislatively, of course. And there are five, count them, five bills currently before Congress designed to overturn, gut, invalidate, and otherwise get rid of Deshay. Because once Deshay is gone, we can harmonize with the vitamin and mineral guideline. So what we're talking about is waking up one morning and being very surprised to find that high potency therapeutically effective clinically significant nutrients are now illegal in the way that heroin is illegal not available with a prescription illegal if these nutrients have any impact on the human body they are illegal that's just the vitamin and mineral guideline let's talk about milk we have recombinant bovine growth hormone and now we can choose milk with it or milk without it butter with it butter butter without it right not under codex because under codex every dairy cow on the planet must be treated with monsanto's recombinant bovine growth hormone furthermore under codex every animal used for food on the planet whether it has fins feet or feathers every animal on the planet must be treated with subclinical antibiotics must be treated with subclinical antibiotics and must be treated with exogenous growth hormones codex requires mandates that all food be irradiated unless it's eaten locally and raw all food including organic food of course so is it organic afterwards well of course the organic standards are incredibly low the organic standards allow a farmer to use veterinary drugs including growth hormones antibiotics etc on animals and then at his whim reclassify them as organic but farmers are our friends and they would never do that right right codex sets limits for the dangerous industrial chemicals that you can have in your food and the limits are incredibly high go to codex alimentarius do a google search and look you know there are drop down menus at the top of the official codex page look at the toxins and the veterinary chemicals and the levels that are set. They are terrifying to me. Terrifying. The names of the chemicals that are permitted and the amounts of the chemicals that are permitted are terrifying to me. Why am I terrified? Well, perhaps I'm just a cowardly person. It's possible. Think about this. In 2001, 176 countries including the United States got together and they said there are 12 really bad organic chemicals they're called POPs persistent organic pollutants there are a lot of them but there are 12 that are so bad that nobody could disagree that those 12 POPs had to be banned worldwide nine of the 12 worst organic chemicals known are pesticides not surprisingly because they kill things and of course we have many um, uh, processes and enzyme systems that are very much like insects and other pests so they're not too good for us but codex has different ideas codex has brought back seven seven of the nine forbidden pops that 176 countries Banned worldwide. Dieldrin, Aldrin, hexachlorobenzene. And the food that is imported from other countries that contains these substances cannot be stopped at our borders. 
because otherwise it would be, God forbid, a trade violation. That's how Codex works. Codex, according to the World Trade Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization, joint projections. Now, I didn't make this up. Please, if you unfastened your intellectual seat belts, put them back on again. If you do the numbers in the WHO FAO projections, the epidemiological projections, they estimate, not I, because what do I know? They estimate, they're the experts, that just the vitamin and mineral guideline alone, when it goes into global implementation on December 31st, 2009, will result in a minimum of three billion, that's B, bad, big, billion deaths, one billion through simple starvation. Those folks who die are not particularly economically successful from the point of view of the corporations. When you're starving to death, how much good can you do when you, the issue is how much can you buy? Not a lot. Forget them. Aha, but the next two billion. They will die from the preventable diseases of undernutrition. Cancer, the single most profitable condition ever known to humankind. Cardiovascular disease, a good second. Diabetes, pretty good producer. And a whole host of other preventable diseases. Who will die? Who knows? Who will live? Probably those people who are wealthy enough and powerful enough to have their own pushers of clean food and nutrients. That's who will live. You and I? Probably not. Our children? Probably not. Our grandchildren? Probably not. So we're talking about food regulations that are, in fact, the legalization of mandated toxicity and undernutrition. It will be illegal if there's a famine in, you know, wherever there's a famine, to ship high nutrient density biscuits to that country. And it will be illegal to distribute them. That's what we're talking about. Codex is big and it's bad, but it's not invulnerable. So the point is that we have to protect ourselves, and I believe that we have to regain global leadership, which we have lost, surrendered, squandered, uh, sold. No? No global? Oh, no, we have. We have sold. Just joining the, w the World Trade Organization surrendered our sovereignty. However, parenthetically, I have a team of constitutional lawyers looking at the following question. Are we members of the WTO? Because if you remember from high school civics, the way you get a treaty to be a real treaty is to have it ratified by a two-thirds majority of the Senate. And the way we got into the WTO was they passed a law allowing Bill Clinton to fast track us into the WTO. That's not a treaty. We are not in the WTO. Now, that's a, a piece of the battle. We, are, we will tell George, but I don't think he's going to be relevant by the time we tell him. Um, so that's a piece of it, but that's not going to save our lives right now because do you know, have, picture in your mind a wasp or a bee trap where the insect voluntarily goes down the, the funnel and then can't get up out of the trap again? That's codex. A regular law can be overturned, it can be repealed, it can be corrected by another piece of legislation. But once we become codex compliant, in any area, as long as we're members of the WTO, it can never 
be repealed because we have lost the sovereignty to become uncodex compliant as long as we're in the WTO. So it's like going down that funnel and not being able to get up out of it. So it's very important that we make sure that we do not become codex compliant. But then we'll be hit with all those big trade sanctions and the country will be destroyed economically, right? No. Remember surprise? One of the principles of war? Remember mass, where you take your strength and put it against the enemy's weakness? Well, here's what we've done. We have a team of lawyers who have spent hundreds of hours with us pro bono. These are good guy lawyers. These two gentlemen and we have spent hundreds of hours studying codex, understanding its weakness says, weakness says, a lot of weakness says, and constructing a strategy which will take the sucker down. It will take it down. But I need you. You are people that other people come to for information about safe, healthy food and nutrients. You are ready-made dissemination points. You are the thousand million, hundred million points of light. Here's what is happening. Every country in the world has to be codex compliant in order not to get hit by WTO trade sanctions, as I told you, if they're members of codex in the WTO. And there are a few countries that are not, but I guarantee you they're not of any major significance. So, the question is, what does codex compliance mean? Well, most people, most countries, most legislators, believe that it means they have to adopt as their national standard on that particular subject, what codex ratified. But that's not the case any more than we're in the WTO. That's not the case either. What it means is that the format, the issues, and the subjects covered by a, co a codex guideline, standard, or regulation have to be addressed in the country's guideline, standard, or regulation on the same topic. So, what we have done is create the first of many alternative codex guidelines. You can go to our website, www.healthfreedomusa.org, and you will see a little button on the upper right-hand side that says, Sign the Citizen's Petition. Now, to briefly digress, a citizen's petition is not like a grocery store petition that you sign and you bring to somebody and you say, I have 200,000 signatures, and they dump it in the wastebasket. Because in their mind, it's one signature, you and your friends wrote 200,000 names. No, it is a legal challenge to the policy of the United States government on codex. It's called a citizen's petition. It's a legal challenge. We're suing the United States government, saying what you're doing is illegal, folks. Let us tell you how. We want hearings of fact. We want redress. We want correction. If we get what we want, that's dandy. If we don't get what we want, we have gone through a process called exhausting administrative remedies. We have made the case ripe for court. Okay, so I need you and everybody you know to sign this citizen's petition saying this is a on bad mass. policy on mass. And you do this on the, on the web and you'll see the instructions and, and we present the thousands and thousands and thousands of actual physical pages that we print out with people's signatures to the U.S. Codex Office and to the FDA and, and they don't like that at all. Um, but that's okay. However, this time, this is the Second Amendment of the citizen's petition that we're asking you to sign. This time, the revised vitamin and mineral guideline is part of it. It's part of the lawsuit saying this needs to be U.S. policy. The more voices that say, this is what I want and you work for me, Mr. and Mrs. Bureaucrat and Mr. and Mrs. Congressman, Mr. and Mrs. Senator, the more voices, the more weight. So step number one is read and sign the citizen's petition. 
Step number two is disseminate the information, the web link. Tell everybody you know, put it out in your office. Get your patients, your friends, your neighbors, your suppliers to sign the citizen's petition. And your suppliers, the companies that you use, are going to tell you that you're out of your minds. They will tell you that Codex is not a problem. And they will tell you, any, anybody here have a dog? Okay. Dog owners know that you ask a dog to heal, sit, down, stay. That's Codex in this country and worldwide. Because the more people who are in Codex coma, the less trouble they have getting this through. So the NNFA, anybody here ever heard of the NNFA? Everybody. Everybody's heard of the NNFA. Did you know that the members of the NNFA are not just health food stores and manufacturers, but include companies with names you may have heard? Pfizer, Merck, Monsanto, Bayer, BASF, Archer Daniels Midland, Kemet, Eastman Chemical, I could go on, Glaxo, Smith Klein, Welcome, Wyeth Arrest, you get the idea. Why? Because after Deshay was passed and the nutrient business burgeoned, the pharmaceutical folks said, and they're not dumb, said there's gold in them our pills. And they bought the means of production of many, many, many companies, and they bought the companies themselves. So they're in the nutrient business. What better way to kill the nutrient business, which is not nearly as profitable as the toxic chemical drug business, than to take it over? Works every time, right? CRN. Anybody here know about CRN? C Council for Responsible Nutrition. Same members. They have lots of multi-level marketing companies. Same members. Okay? And they're serving their members' needs. They're saying, CRN is saying, yay, Codex is coming. It's going to protect us from those dangerous vitamins and minerals and herbs. And CRN is saying, it's fine. Go to sleep, lullaby, and good night, everything's fine. And they use a report that they commissioned at a reputed cost of $800,000. A report, Sidley, Austin, Brown, and Root, a law firm in Washington, wrote a report for them. And it said, lullaby, and good night, everything's fine. It won't have an impact on the United States, everything's fine. Sidley, Austin, Brown, and Root has one major client, whose name you might know, Merck. Now, it's entirely possible that NNFA just did a spectacularly bad job of due diligence, or not. Anyway, the report says everything's fine, everything's dandy, no problem, we've got Deshay. Yeah, sure we do. Now let's talk about Australia. Remember five laws before Congress to overturn Deshay. And you can write to Congress on the website. The click of a mouse. I call it riding the freedom mouse. It's called security. Now, Congress uses a multiplier of 13,000 to 1. Every email, fax, phone call, letter. Don't write letters. They get decontaminated. They never get to Congress. Every email, fax, and phone call counts as 13,000 constituent opinions. They figure that if you write a letter or send an email, there are 12,999 lazy lunks who can't bother to get to the computer terminal to do the same thing, but they feel the way you do. Interesting. That's power, my friends. That's power. That's 13,000 to one. So suppose we have a million people. Suppose we have 10 million people. Suppose we have a hundred million people saying, don't you dare. Now, Congress has one rule above all others. Anybody know what it is? Get reelected. Re That's the primary rule, the prime directive, as Isaac Asimov would have called it. The prime directive is to get reelected. Now, Deshay was passed, you may remember, by unanimous congressional consent. Was that because one morning all members of Congress woke up and said, I see the light. 
Nutrients are better than drugs. No. no. They said, oh, if I don't go along with this, I'll never be reelected to anything. You know what? Critical mass. Remember, we were out on the streets, and we were up on our hind legs, and we were making noise. And we were rallying, and we were writing letters, and we said, don't you dare take away my health freedom. Remember? And we won. Except we got fat, dumb, and lazy and stopped protecting ourselves. So now we're in the same place again. Except it's all food instead of just nutrients. So that's point number one. Use the freedom mouse. Ride the Freedom Mouse. We've made it as easy as possible on the site. Sign up for the emails. I will never sell your information to anyone, I promise. I will never rent it. I will never share it. You'll only get email from me. And we need you to know what's going on. So I'll send you email blasts. I'll send you uh, things that you can do or not. You know, it's your choice. Get everybody you know informed. Now, what else can you do? Well, we're going to write a series of Codex Alternative Guidelines. Everything bad in Codex will have an alternative guideline that turns it into a pro-health guideline. What have we done with the guideline, the vitamin and mineral guideline? You can see that because we have a markup copy that has their guideline crossed out and ours written in on the website. It's right there. What we've done is turn it into something, into a guideline that mandates biochemically, individually determined optimal health. And it's still codex compliant. So we said, OK, now we need Congress to adopt this. And we need other countries in the world to adopt this. So uh, Bert and I went to Washington, DC. And we met with Dana Rohrabacher from Orange County, who said to us, He's a uh, representative. He said, I believe in pesticides. I went, ooh. He said, I believe in GMOs. I went, ooh, ooh. He said, I believe in irradiation of food. I went, ooh, ooh, ooh. But, he said, I believe in your right to not be forced to eat foods that have been processed that way more than I believe in those technologies. I will take this on. We said, oh, that's really nice. <laughs> and he said, now, we need a coalition. So we went across the aisle, or across the office building, to see Peter DeFazio's staff from Oregon, who is a liberal Democrat, whereas uh, uh, Rohrabacher is a Republican, a libertarian Republican. And DeFazio's on board. And we have large numbers of others who actually never heard of Codex before we told them about it. Never heard of Codex. We have called every health legislative aide in Congress. And we have said, what's your congressman's position on Codex? And they've said, blah. <laughs> we have spoken to the trade legislative assistants. We've said, what's your congressman's position on Codex? And they've said, a lot. They don't know. We had a congressional briefing set up on the 20th of September. I was going to address Congress, tell them about it. I thought that was cool. Ten days before, it became a briefing on something else. Another freedom click. You need to write to Congress on the site and tell them that they need a congressional briefing by God and tell them you want me to brief them. They don't know. They've never heard of it any more than the general public has heard of it. Gee, how'd that happen? Who knows? Every negative part of Codex can be overturned by a guideline, a regulation, or a standard that is positive. So we need your help, because the United States leadership in this guideline and all the positive guidelines to follow is what's going to literally save the population of the planet and save your jobs, and your children, and your families, and mine. Thank you.